the entrepreneurial journey podcast we're talking business and building a culture that's kick-ass where we make it happen grab your seat let's have a blast at the entrepreneurial journey Hello and welcome to the Entrepreneurial Journey podcast. Today, I'm delighted to have Eric Doyle with me. Hello, Eric. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's, it's, I'm thrilled to be here. This is this is brilliant. Thanks for inviting right. me. No, absolute pleasure. So you are the found, founder and senior co- consultant at Crooks. That's actually quite hard to say all in one go. It really is. It really, yeah. I, need to work on that. I need to work on that. <laughs> what does that involve? So we, we are a business who we help we help organizations across sectors and across geographies, um, mainly with uh, with a topic known as social selling and influence. Um, we, we help companies to enable their teams to be strategic with social media. And the, the kind of headline that we use is we, we help to position them as the, the leading technical and commercial digital influencers in their sector and take all the benefits that come from that. Ah, OK. So social selling. Yeah, that that that's a huge term, isn't it? It's 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 an enormous term that's sadly undervalued. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of people have have convinced businesses to part with their hard earned cash and just you know put them through a sort of two hour masterclass in social selling. Um, and just to put that in context, our program is twelve weeks. Yeah. Um, twelve weeks. Um, because we need twelve weeks. We're not, we're not. We're not in this for you know boom and bust in and out. We're we're trying to change behaviours. What we're talking about is a complete commercial digital mindset shift, and that takes a bit of time and coaching and training and a mixture of both to get it cemented in teams. So that so that by the time when when we leave as trainers and coaches, that company can then go on and flourish and build from there. So so yeah, it's a huge topic and it's becoming more important month on month. It's the old adage, isn't it, of teaching somebody to fish and they can feed themselves the rest of their life rather than just giving them a fish. Yep. Yep. We're often called in, uh, we're not ambulance chasers by any means, but we're often called into companies who have spent money on a, a four hour masterclass with their team and nothing changed and, and everything has to change. That's the point. Everything has to change. Um, so, so yeah, we work with brilliant organizations across the energy sector and tech and SAS and, uh, public uh, public services, uh, um, tax, finance, insurance, all that kind of stuff, enabling the team because you know as well as I do, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners know that the um, we're at a position now where the people are becoming more powerful than than the brand, yeah, and um, and all of that, people find it very difficult to to build relationships with brochures, um, but people find it very easy to build relationships with technically minded people with great experience great personalities uh, and that's what it's all about it's about putting together that that history of experience and specialism and and the the the, the willingness to help and a bit of personality out there in a structured process and format on social media to allow companies to build influence grow relationships and convert that into commercial interaction it has to be converted into commercial interaction it it really doesn't it takes time i think the issue I've always had in the past is that people are trying to tell you that you get instant results, and that's just not true. Long gone are the days where you could just post something and make a sale. Um, if they ever existed, Eric, do you think they have, those days ever existed? No, I don't think they did. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't think they did. Um, you know, if you think about analog, I mean, I came from an analog sales and marketing world. Um, Nothing happened quickly in the B two B world when you're trying to deliver large projects or 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 sell into large organisations for large amounts of money. Um, the relationship building process, the 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 proving your competence process, and being trusted process takes time, takes time. And even when I was, I used to run companies, and I don't I don't remember just finding a company on the internet or a company that just put out a good post and saying send them a purchase order, will you? It just did, didn't happen didn't happen. Takes time, takes time, but the rewards are worth it. Yeah, they are. Often with big organizations, I think there's, um, I think it's very hard to look out up 
and over the big organization because it, it the image I've got in my head, Eric, now is that some large corporates do feel like some kind of citadel on yeah. their own with walls all around them. And, and to step outside of those walls, one, you've got to have the leadership who are brave enough to do that. Um, and, and two, I think you have to have the trust in your teams that they are putting the right kind of stuff out there and sending the right kind of messages. So at what level do you deliver this training? So we, we, we request that all of our clients, we start from the top. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we start. I mean, I mean, we start. We start across the C-suite. Uh, if if one of our clients wants to, you know, just do all of the sales team or the technical team, that's fine. But there's real benefit in doing. Actually, my favorite way to deliver it. We can start with the the C-suite. That's wonderful. Then move across sales, marketing, technical, um, and all the other the other functions in the organization. My favorite to do is is do a diagonal slice and do okay. multiple cohorts with a diagonal slice. So I love. When we have cohorts with a uh, one member of the C-suite, uh, a sales team leader, HR, uh, procurement, supply chain, operations, technical, that is that is that allows us then to do something which we didn't do before in the analog world. I'm going back, you know, even five, ten years ago. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> marketing did all their marketing stuff and hopefully opened up some leads for sales to get in there and go and convert. Now we can change that. We can flip it on its head. I'm not saying that those rules are defunct, but they are different. But there is something quite wonderful. If you've got a target organization, a big target organization, if we can have people multi-threading through that organization, building digital relationships and forming little digital communities, why why shouldn't your HR director be in touch with all the HR people at that target organization and connected with them and building influence with them? The same for your engineers, the same for your supply chain people. And we find that once we do that, the, the whole the whole concept of commercial interaction between that organization is a lot smoother and a lot easier because I don't want to sound too twee, but we've all become digital friends and we all understand each other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people have got to know each other then, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the relationships start in the digital world but they soon end up on a Teams or a Zoom call or a phone call, and then and then you're having a coffee, and before you know it, there's a lunch. Yeah, and and then before you know it, you're invited to come and and talk to the technical team about that uh, about your your products and services and how they might help them, and and it just goes on from. And before you know it, you're tendering. Um. So so this this whole this beautiful social story must lead to some sort of commercial interaction, or we're just creating lovely digital art and doing nothing yeah. with it. Yeah, no, I agree. That's good. So, um, okay, you got into this via an interesting route. It wasn't a traditional route into no. social selling. How how did you end up here? Um, I read a book. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Great job done. No, I uh, I I um, latterly in my my sort of corporate career, I was managing organisations. So I was a board member and managing director of uh, energy service companies. Uh, I kind of grew up in energy. I came through engineering into sales and marketing and then started on the general management kind of trail. Um, but I noticed everything was changing around about 2017. I was hiring very expensive sales and marketing professionals and finding out pretty quickly that yet again, they weren't able to deliver the way they were with the toolbox that they had. And something happened. Um I, I wasn't really big into social media, to be quite honest, back in 2017. I thought it was a bit a bit of a joke, to be honest. I put right. I put mountain biking and uh, and barbecue pictures on Facebook. LinkedIn was just somewhere that I went to spy on my competition and see if I could poach some people across. Yeah. Um, and then and then I made a simple. I, I I don't think I'd even made a comment on LinkedIn before. That's how that's how far behind I was. And I saw that one of our big prospects had put a comment, uh, a post on LinkedIn, and I was really angered by all the the comments below from all of our competition, basically saying we have the solution. We've, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that, and they were being very prescriptive. So I, I, I did something I'd never done before, and I replied saying, "Hi X, um, we would take a different approach because your problem is very technical and requires some technical thinking before we can even start talking about solutions." Um, and that that interaction led to us winning a massive project, a huge margin, and no one in the organization could tell me what that thing was called. How do you how do you 
How does talking to someone on social media result in high margin, high revenue work and unseating your biggest competition? And no one can tell me. So I started reading about it. And I, I, I read this book by this person in America and this person in Germany and this person from France, and none of it was really gelling with me. But then I read um, uh, Social Selling, The Art of Influencing Buyers and Changemakers by Tim Hughes, and it made complete sense. I contacted Tim. I said, look, I'm thinking about leaving my board position, and I think I think you and I should work together. And Tim and I became great friends, um, business partners, um, um, or, or, or sort of associate partners. And I set up a consultancy. I went away and trained with Tim and his company, DLA Ignite. And I came back and I said, right, I'm going to take this to the energy industry. And our company's gone from energy into a bunch of other sectors. So, so yeah, I quite an unusual route, but um, I see it as being kind of shifting with the tide. I noticed there was a shift and I did something about it. Um, it would have been easy to just get another job and employ those principles, but I thought, wouldn't it be great to train people? And uh, and I've had I've had uh, you know been doing it for over three years now. I've had some wonderful clients, and had some wonderful times, and seen people just blossom, just yeah. blossom, just brilliant. Well, you unlock something that is. It, it, I was talking to my thirteen-year-old daughter last mm. night, actually, at the dinner table, and we were talking about how parents are often a little bit scared of the world that they inhabit because it's very alien to us. You know, she is a digital native. Yep. She was, I remember when she was 18 months old, she'd worked out how the iPad worked within seconds. And, and it was that point you thought, mm, okay. Yep. Um, and, and they inhabit a world that our generation just did not grow up with. So our discussion last night was that actually she understands the risks of being online and on Snapchat much more than we understand the risks. Yeah. We understood the risks growing up of playing out on the street and you knew which streets to avoid and you knew which kids to avoid because there were trouble. And I think business owners are the same. They didn't grow up necessarily with social selling. So it's quite scary. It is, it is quite scary. And I think that, I think converting that being scared into being inquisitive is the first step. Yeah. And having, having open conversations, just like you did with your 13 year old is having open conversations with your management team. The evidence now is, is it's, it's ridiculous. The amount yeah. of evidence we're now, we used to, we used to have to try and convince companies that, that social and digital were, were was happening now and was the future. We don't anymore because there's so much evidence out there. All of buying has moved to digital growing influence, building influence and, and understanding how to walk digital corridors and have digital conversations as professionals is now known across the world. Yeah. Um, but but there are still some professionals, as you like, rightly put it, leaders and, and just you know people in organizations who are scared because of a bad experience on social media or what they read in the press. Um, that fear usually comes from not knowing how to claim what's yours and not knowing how to behave and how to act. And that simple, that simple act of getting trained and being coached gives you that sort of thunk moment, as we call it, where you start to realize, I have, I have two train tracks here. If I operate in between these two train tracks, magical things happen. I'm not going to go out there and I'm not going to put out content about sensitive subjects that are going to start arguments with the, with the, with the world because our ambition here is to grow networks, not shrink them. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so it's working out a content plan that people understand that they can that they can work with for eternity, for eternity, not just for a week. Or yeah, I, I put something on uh, on LinkedIn last month and uh, it got such and such an amount of likes and job done. No, this is this is this is how we prospect and network now. This is how we do it, and being very good at this gives us a commercial edge in our competition. So, so often we 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 try and we try and ask, just just submit to this. It's safe. We're not going to be putting you in a position that you're uncomfortable with. We're not going to be opening you up to criticism. All we're going to do is showcase your expertise, your specialism, your thought leadership, your thought reference, and your personality a little bit. We're not yeah. going to put you out there and ask you to comment on a particularly sensitive political topic or something like that. Um, we're not going to do that. This is a safe repeatable, scalable process. That's good. Okay. So Eric, you're in the desert once <gasps> upon a time. I was. I was. <laughs> oh my goodness. You brought it all back. You brought it all back. Yeah. 
and you were you were running a crazy race. I was. But not content to just doing that once. You did it twice? Did it twice. Or as or as some some of my friends would say, I did it one and three quarter times because the first time I went to do it was an abject failure. Okay. An absolute failure. I went to take on the mighty Marathon de Sabla, six marathons end to end across the searing heat of the Sahara Desert, fully self-sufficient. They call it the toughest foot race on earth. Um, and I got into a bit of trouble first right. time. But I had to go back again and do it properly. And in, and in fact, this is a very neat segue into the fact that I'll be talking about this on Saturday in my upcoming TED Talk on the Woo-hoo! same subject. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't want you to um, give a talk away, but suffice to say, in the end, you did it, didn't you? In the end, you achieved what you set out to achieve. Yeah, I had to rewire everything. I had to reset and rethink everything. But the whole the whole concept of my TED Talk is that passion will often can can get us to the start line in many aspects of our lives, in domestic and business life, but it often fizzles out. If you take that passion and surround it with a really good flexible plan and a solid strategy and it anchor all of that in a really supportive and dynamic community, then then you will go further. Yeah. That's yeah. the point. A passion with a plan, um, which beautifully, one of my favorite symbols is the yin-yang symbol because it Lovely. combines masculine and feminine energy beautifully. Mm. And we translate that when we work with our clients into balancing the culture and the commercial aspects of the, the business. And if you get that balance right, then people operate better and they're able to fulfill their true potential. Absolutely. And and that, again, that relates to passion and planning, you know, dreaming and execution. You need the heart and then you need the head to help you get you there. Now, you sound, Eric, like somebody these days who is more heart-driven and then you have the strategy, the planning, and the execution. Was that always the case? Do you think? No, I think I think uh, I think that's come over time. Obviously, we evolve and change, and we flex as we get older, and tastes and palates change, and all of that. I think I was I think I was always um, a bit headstrong in the early days. You know, come with me. I have a plan. Who's with me? Let's go, and we start kicking walls down and finding if there was anything there. But that that uh, that balance, as you put it, of the whole thing about passion, passion can all, all, you know often get us to the start line in something, um, but it needs to be backed up with a solid plan. Has become more and more prevalent as I got older. Um, I, th- I think one of my strengths was was having the passion to get going, and not often thinking about the next steps and all of that, which I which I'll talk about in the talk. Um, but I think that balance has become more key to me moving forward, and and perhaps more head driven now and supported by heart rather than the other way around. Mm, interesting. Once heard um, a former commander in chief of the British army said, look, you have a battle plan and you write the battle plan out and you know, the, the minute the battle starts, the plan's gone out of the window, Yeah, but you need the plan. My good, my good friend, Tim Wiggum that I've had on my own podcast said, um, um, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. That's, I think that was the phrase this chap used. Yes. Yeah, no plan survives. So actually, actually changing the plans written into the plan. Yeah. Yes. Love that. Yeah, I know. But do you know a lot of people get stuck yes. down, down here, don't they? And, and this probably comes into your job in social selling. They probably get, well, do we do LinkedIn? Do we do Instagram? Do we do Twitter? What Do we do TikTok? And they get do so involved. Yeah, you could do it all. And then get so into tied in knots. Yes, yes. They they don't do anything. Correct. Absolutely. Um I I you know, part of this part of of what we're doing with organizations is getting everyone to relax. Just take a breath. Just take a breath. Let's do the assessment and the strategy piece up first. Find out where we need to be. There is no point in in crashing in and trying to do a million platforms at the same time. Where do the majority of our prospects and really good people that can help us commercially, where do they live? They may, they may live in one or two places, right? Okay, let's focus on one or two and get, the, get them absolutely perfect and, and get everyone to relax and be comfortable in that environment. 
and and being comfortable almost like it's muscle memory, almost like it's muscle memory to the point. We've worked with people who've joined our programs that are in their 60s, real, real naysayers, um, who in, in relation to the size of their network, just by following a process and actually being present and building influence and following a rhythm of content that we've that we we understand that works to help build influence and draw people towards you have ended up with I know this isn't the goal but they've ended up with viral content regular viral content in relation to the size of their network people who couldn't believe that anyone why would anyone want to read my story why would anyone want to be inter- why would anyone be interested in my thought leadership on a on a particular you know who am I you know well you are extremely valuable you're extremely precious and you're a you're an expert or a specialist in what you do and no one knows you so we're going to change that yeah and for the first time in history i think we can properly measure marketing activity yeah it, it used to be you know we'd stick an ad when i was in recruitment we'd stick an ad in the scotsman and you get a certain number of replies and you could track them and work out how many placements you made but you also got people that would look at that and and just not do anything at that moment in time um so you never knew whether that was just helping with general profile or whether it's a specific ad but now we can track everything and measure everything, everything so you know it's working every every piece of content you put out every comment you make every profile you view every like comment and impression you get on your own content um, is all actionable and measurable. Yeah. And, and a simple metric like, um, actively growing your network towards target verticals. Yeah. You know, like, um, I go into organizations and we do these social audits and I'll work with sales leaders and they'll say that our, our two big target companies that we've been trying for ages to get some work from are company X and company Y. And we do, okay, who's responsible for the, the, the drive into those companies. Well, it's um, it's John and Joanne. Okay, let's look, go and look at John and Joanne. John and Joanne, you're resp- John, you're responsible for company X. Joanne, you're responsible for company Y. Yes. Let's have a look at how many deep connections we have in there. Nine, right. four. Okay. They're right. Okay. 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 Right. So the mere the mere fact and act of doubling, tripling, quadrupling, and continually growing the size of network digital network you have in those target verticals helps everything because you're now more visible. You can convert that visibility into qualified relevance and combine that with a really good content plan. These people are going to start to be, and it's a horrible word. I, I, I wish there was another word for it because it's been, it's been kind of tainted over the years. These people will start to be influenced by you. They will. Yeah. But a lot of people hate that word when I talk about becoming technical and commercial influencers. I can see people's, I can see people shrivel on the Zoom calls or in the conference rooms. I don't want to be an influencer. I just want to be an engineer. Well, um, somebody, it was uh, the lovely Andrew Morrison of AM Bid uh, a few years ago said, you're my business friend and I like business friends. Yeah. And I think I prefer that to influencer because you can make business friends um, and people sort of pop up in your comments and you think, oh, okay, they they clearly have warmed to whatever it is that you're doing yes. and that's really nice. And you think, oh, I've I've made another business friend. Um, so feel free to st- steal that because I've stolen that off Andrew. Um, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Life's all about plagiarism. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Pass it <laughs> on, play it forward. Okay, so I've got a scenario for you, Eric. We right. have got, th- this is made up, okay? okay. So you've got, a real old school digital what a load of nonsense i've done mm-hmm. it this way all my life i've built the business and you know there's plenty of examples of people who've built phenomenally successful businesses um that haven't gone anywhere near let's choose linkedin because it's a business focus podcast yeah. What what do you say to them about how things are going in the future of their business and, and why would they want to change if everything they've done so far has got them to where they are? First of all, um, how on earth did you get into uh, that Zoom call with that company I was talking to on Friday? Um, because <laughs> that's pretty much spot on. 
Um, the second piece is, um, so my, my conversation with an organization doesn't start with anything that we do. It starts with what they do. So we need to unpack um, what, what used to happen and what happens now. Okay. So, so in terms of the, the numbers that they're producing, in terms of the, the growth that they're seeing, are they exactly where they want to be? Often the case is no. Often the case is no. It's pipelines gone down. Um, leads are shrinking. Opportunities are on the decrease. And as a consequence of that, less proposals out the door, less tenders, less revenue, less EBITDA. And that's, that's the kind of normal, when I end up on a call with someone who said, can you come and speak to our management team? That's normally what I suspect is going to be the case. And it normally is. Something's going wrong. The numbers are going down, but the headcount's just the same and the overhead's just the same, which is a horrible financial situation. Horrible financial situation. So they're at that point where they're, they're thinking. So usually when I, when I meet a team and we get them on a call or I end up in a conference room, it's because things have changed and either they're aware that something's going on in the world, this digital thing, the social thing, or they've no clue. Okay. And uh, my point is, my, my first question is, what do you want to do? What do you want to address? What's, 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 the, what's the top two things that we need to address? Okay, it's, um, it's pipeline and it's uh, recruitment. They're very common. We can't find people and um, um, we've got people leaving because our pipeline's going down and we need people to replace them, to come in and deliver against projects and we're in a horrible quandary. So one of the things that's one of the that, you know one of the things we do is is sit down and put a strategy together. So we develop a strategy with them to placate them. Um, we we say very conservatively that the companies that are on our books that have become what we call social organisations that have made that switch from analog to digital. Okay. This is going to sound this is going to sound quite brisk, but this is this has been very conservative. Companies that convert to become social organisations and actually do what they do from from network growth, content, all the way through to commercial interaction. So our promise to these organizations is that if you do this, and we'll show you other companies that do this, you can even interview them if you want, you can expect to see a 30% increase in revenue and a 40% decrease in sales cycle times. Wow. So would a 30% increase in revenue, you know, brackets, 30 per, 30% at least, would that be interesting to you? Yes. Would a 40% decrease in sales cycle, what's your sales cycles times like now? Well, in one product line, it's 60 days. In one product line, it's 180 days. If we shorten that by 40%, would that be helpful? Yes. Right. There are some things we need to do then. Um, and what this is going to require is lots of commitment, lots of focus, a fair bit of energy, and it's going to require most of the team that are coming on this to put some preconceptions aside for a little minute. You want, you want the revenue, you want the recruitment focus, you want the reduced sales cycle times, you want the EBITDA. Then what we're going to have to maybe put aside is things like, well, I don't like social media. Oh, LinkedIn's just becoming Facebook. Put that all to one side. Put that all to one side and think about this as the future of our commercial journey. So what's more important? Withholding, withholding some... I don't like, therefore I won't, or the success of our organization in our sector. What's more important? And if, and if truly I don't like, I'm not going to do it, is the answer, then fine. You, you probably shouldn't come on the course. You yeah. probably shouldn't come on the program. It's not for yeah. everyone. But if you're up for doing something new and modern that could potentially rescue your company and, can, and see continued success for your company, then we're going to have to behave, act, and think a little bit differently. And if that's okay, then we'll move forward onto module one and we'll start the process. Um, um, and generally that, that sort of, when people realize that this isn't, I think people have got into a bit of a, a bit of a, on a bit of a hamster wheel of social media is just where just people just post stuff. Actually, if you think about social media as a, a modern business driver and a, an access to this digital twin, as we talk about the digital, the digital version of your sector, the access point is through through social media to allow you to go in and play there and, and win there kind of changes mindsets a little bit. Completely, completely. The analogy I 
go back to is and um, when I was in recruitment all those years, we you know we were targeted five canvas calls a day, two visits a week, blah blah blah, and you had to you remember it. You had to, a canvas call was getting through to the decision maker. Well, you try getting hold of a decision maker these days unless you do it via LinkedIn. The only you can no longer just pick up the phone and talk to a decision maker the way no, you used forget to. Forget it. Forget it. It's over. You, you have to go via LinkedIn in order to do it. And and you also and and this is really this has just popped into my head as we've been talking. Now my brother and um, I are in business together, and he was struggling with LinkedIn because he didn't like it. All those things. Oh, I don't like social media, but he's now found a way to be himself on LinkedIn. And I think that's re- he was trying to be somebody he's not. And you, you, you can only hold that mask up for so long. Yeah. And so he wasn't engaging. But now through encouragement of myself and, and somebody else external, because you always need an external, you never listen to your parents, but you listen to your friend's parents because yep. he's had an external say, you need to be yourself, Nick. I went, I've been telling you that for months. Anyway, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, he's now embracing it and I think he'll enjoy it a great deal more. Um, and he'll have more, more, when you take the mask off, yeah. And you realize the one true unique thing about me and the one tr- truly unique thing about you, Rebecca, is you. You're the only unique thing about you. Um, um, once you realize that, it opens up many more doors for content because you don't have to think, well, I need to pretend to be this, so I need to write this stiff article about my technical prowess or whatever. When you just relax into yourself and go, all these other doors open up. For amazing, amazing, um, uh, you know, like proper, insightful content about you as an individual and about you as a professional individual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because these people out there, they have so much to give and so much to offer. Uh, and I've said to I said to Nick and I said to another client, look, it's actually rude not for you to share what you know, because other people would just benefit enormously from this. That's what it's for. That's yeah. really what it's for. It's like, um, you know, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm working with a, a chap just now and I said, in your, in your world, who are the top three in the world? And he said, I think I'm in it. Right. I said, that's, that's amazing. He said, cool. I might even be, might even be in the top two in the world in my, cool. in my subject matter. And he said, I'm not being big headed. That's, that's a fact. I said, well, yeah. that's wonderful. The downside is no one knows who you are. Yeah. You've got it all in your own head. Yeah. No one knows who you are. So we're going to change that. We're going to, we're going to showcase this. We're not going to give away all your secrets. We're going to showcase this. Yeah. And we're going to continually pull people towards willingly that want to walk towards your learned content about what it is you do. And also we're going to show a little bit of your personality so that, so that people can see that you're, you're not just this absolute boffin who's going to terrify them. You're actually a nice guy. You're a nice guy. Amazing. Brilliant. Okay. So where are you taking the business, Eric? Where are we taking the business? Um, we're going to continue working with new clients. I've just, I've just uh, taken on a couple of associates, one in Canada and one in Oklahoma. Great. So Tracy in Calgary and Terra, if you're listening, uh, welcome. Um, so future expansion, more associates. Good. We're also uh, in my partnership with Tim Hughes's business, DLA Ignite. We're very excited about the metaverse. Ooh. Ooh. So we are we're building offices in the metaverse and hope cool. to be hope to be um doing some really cool projects in there and inviting prospects and clients to come in and don't get me wrong, I'm I'm not I'm not here to chat about uh my expertise in the metaverse, but I'm having a hell of a lot of fun in the work that we're doing. So I think the metaverse is is coming up. Um but you know, we we uh we specialize in one thing. We take organizations from analog to that digital through social selling and influence. We enjoy it. And uh, this is probably a massive failure in my business plan, but I'm just going to keep doing it because I love it. No, quite right. And if your business had a character or personality, how would you describe it? Or who would it be? Oh, a character or personality, it would be, let me think, a character or personality, seriously fun, serious things done in a fun way. Because if I'm not having fun doing it, I'm not going to do them anymore. I've decided that. Yeah. And who would who would it be? I don't know. Vic Reeves. <laughs> I love Vic Reeves. 
<laughs> I'm glad you said that. I love Terry. <laughs> He's great. <laughs> Irreverent, yeah. funny, funny, slightly crazy, slightly sees crazy. the world from a very different angle to everybody else. There you go. There you Love go. But hopefully have some value to people. Yeah, definitely. Amazing. Thank you so much, Eric. I wish you every success. Same to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much for having me. Brilliant. The Entrepreneurial Journey talking business and building a culture that's kick-ass